Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Talks. Today we're here to interview Catherine Faber, and we're here to talk about a study we are collaborating on. So I'm just going to share my screen. Catherine and I, we created this survey to understand the correlations between tri-type Enneagram and the 16 Myers-Briggs types. So feel free to take it. 400 and 45 people have already done so. You will be entered for a chance to win a $50 gift card and you will be helping the future of type. So I'll have the link below for those of you who are curious and you want to help contribute. And on that note, I also have a course with Catherine that's coming up. You can find it on her website. It's called Personality Matrix, an introduction to the correlations between the 16 personality types and the 27 tri-types. And so it is on sale right now until January. And so feel free to check it out in the links below too. We're also creating a certification called Personality Matrix, which is why this is titled Personality Matrix. And so it'll be correlating tri-types with the 16 personality types. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, we're really hoping to understand more about how people that are more versed in MBTI that perhaps are learning the Enneagram now, but how they're going to answer very simple adjectives that they would use to describe themselves to a total stranger. Because I have the research that I did almost 10 years ago. It will be 10 years ago by the time we teach the class. But they were mostly Enneagram people that didn't know as much about MBTI. So to have the big picture, we need both. So please, please, please participate. We re really want to offer that information to help clear up some mistypings or how to recognize more about the types. And as a way to show you a little bit about the correlations between Enneagram and the 16 types, Catherine and I are going to contrast things about us to showcase our Enneagram type today. And so, Catherine, um, I'd love to talk about our micro expressions and what they tell about our personality type. And so we're great contrast because my tri-type is 926 and Catherine is an 874. And so we are different down to our body language. And this is something, and also our, our facial expressions too. And this is something that Catherine teaches in her courses. And so I'm wondering, Catherine, if you can give us the lowdown. Yeah, you know what? I learned about micro expressions in 1976. So I knew all these systems before I learned about the Enneagram. As a result, I could quickly see modifications or variations within type or things that clustered in type. Now, core energetics, I didn't learn until 1996, but they all factor in when we're considering someone's type, their tri-type, their MBTI, or their instinctual stackings. It's really the cluster coming together that reveals Kind of, well, I think the most important thing that I found was that only 20% of people were easy to type. And 80%, we needed these additional systems. But once you know these additional systems, it reverses. And there are only 20% of people that take a lot more effort. So we're a great example. Now, we're not the same type with different variables. But what we do share is we're both gut types and we're both sexual. So a sexual gut type has a particular focus and it's on wanting to let go of your boundaries and your certainties with the person that's a twin or a match. So that's how we would be the same, that we're going to be much more forthcoming privately, like with each other, than we will be with just anyone. But one-on-one, -on -one, if we feel that, connection, not just with the two of us, but with other people that we feel bonded to, then we're going to be a completely different person. And this is not understood by people that don't have cross training, that when you put a gut type who's saying, I want my stuff, I want it where I want it, the way I want it. And this is even the nine, this isn't just the eight. 
but eights, we go a little over the top with our stuff, but it's like, we'll surrender it to have, in the case of the nine, the sexual nine, that union fusion, it's like mock symbiosis. And for the eight, it's possession surrender. So I want to give up control, but it has to be someone strong enough, devoted enough, connected enough, and then... I don't need to control my stuff in quite the same way. But in both cases, if someone does not tend to the bonding and the devotion for either one of us, then we're going to withhold in our own way. We both become more resistant. You become more stubborn. Yeah, so we both become resistant. As a sexual nine, you get more stubborn and withholding by not saying something, and I will do the same, only say something, but we'll both pull away. And that's why gut types will say, I have very strong boundaries. Well, really the boundaries are what we're feeling in the moment. So if we feel our boundaries crossed, we've set it. But if we're okay with someone crossing our boundaries, we can let that line move. And that's what gut types have to realize is that's what's going on for us and why we have to realize, oh yeah, right. Okay. I guess I do have moving boundaries that I'm unaware of. But the sexual, we move those boundaries in a nanosecond if we feel in sync with someone. It could be a total stranger that we just met. Would you say it differently? Absolutely. I would agree that there's this lock on and there is this desire to have the deepest relationship possible with that person, almost spiraling into depth with another. And so the sexual instinct senses people instantly that they can do that with, and then tries to create that bond that will go as deep as humanly possible. Yeah. It's almost like we have a little antenna going, me, 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 match not match. And that's really became something that I focused on with that first research on the internal experience of type. The instincts were just the most clear and it changed a lot of what was understood about the types. Now we're going back into the dinosaur days, but for me, this was in the eighties and I didn't do the research till 94 just to give a perspective. So we used to say you had one type and then the subtype was added and it truly is a subtype rather than a variant, but you have to know the history. And then the difference is like you mentioned the spiraling down. Well, I would also say we spiral up. So the enjoyment, we're going deeper into your turn, my turn, you add, I add. It's not just someone listening to us. We need to interact and it has to be mutual. If it's too much one way or the other, we lose interest. It's not an intimate bond anymore. So while it's enjoyable, we're spiraling up, but it's going deep, so it's spiraling down. So for sure it's a spiral and it's moving all over the place as the discussion moves and changes and diverges. But you, no matter what direction it goes, it goes back into another. And if someone's not sexual, they just start a new tangent without connecting it to the earlier discussion, but sexuals come back to it is mm. real important distinction. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes total sense. And so to pivot back to the topic of micro expressions, Catherine is able to notice your type sometimes by the way that you hold yourself. And so she'll notice like sometimes I'll, I'll do this shoulder. I don't, I don't know what you would call it. Shoulder shake. Weird. And it's, yeah, shoulder wiggle to connect with you. And it's a Enneagram 2 micro expression or bodily trait. And so I'm curious about what are some of your eight traits that you show through your Yeah, like so the eight, it's like we're kind of an enigma, especially the sexual eight. But it's more that we have a lot of definite 
perspectives. So it can seem like we're inflexible, but actually we're very flexible. We're not going to argue with something that works better, but we'll always have an opinion. And when we have an opinion, the jaw goes up. So even if we're sitting below someone, it's just like a throwing off of the energy. It's a very, even if we're doing it playfully. Now, if we're concentrating, then we almost have no expression, but it will come across as a negative expression to people who are looking for friendliness and response. But it's just simply that we're concentrating. And even the most extroverted eight will just kind of cross their arms and do telephone in a way to concentrate. But other people don't have the big gestures. Now, if they happen to be an extreme extrovert, let's say an ESFP or an ENTP or ENFP, all three of them, but there's going to be a bigger energy if that extroversion is strong. But with Eight, it'll be like chopping motion. It won't be movements like this. It'll be like exclamation points or adamant or a lot, of, a lot of gestures up here with the extrovert. Now, eights are usually extroverted, even the most self pres eight, and even the, an eight that is an introvert, it's so close to extroversion. But as you know, I go back to teaching the 16 types the way they were taught in the 80s. So the big change was from having four letters, introverted extroversion, intuitive and sensing and thinking and feeling and perceiving and judging. So you end up with your four, but then in that training, we were taught that if you were within a few points, it was not clearly delineated and you were an X, but you still had to find out which is the lead. So like in my case, I'm very close. I'm an ENTP because of the big, the creative, the little with the small, conceptual and detailed, changing new ideas are far more interesting to me, but I don't have the cute quality that like my son has, who's an ENFP. It's just like the difference is glaring, but wonderfully distinct. He's also an 846, so he's more intense, but he's got the softer little fairies and leprechaun quality that I just don't have. But my ENTP is looking broad and wide and I have to take it in, assess it, and then deliver it. But if you challenge me, no, there's no hesitation. It comes from some place. I don't even know where it comes from. But the language with the aid is more like, there's more of the narrowing of the eye. Now, all of us do that when we wanna make a point. We'll cock our head and, narrow one eye, but we don't have all the movement that a six has. Like what? No, really? Well, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? And that is a telltale sign of six. And Joyce, you can do that at times when you're in your thinking part, because you have six as your head type, where I have seven and I'm an extrovert. You're an introvert. So you're going to go internally and I'm going to have a mouth that does this, even when I'm not mad, I either have a smile, but it's also the micro expression we use the most. Now the nine is more serene. So there's more of a pleasant smile. And because you have two, there'd be more compliments. And because of the six, they'd be reassuring. And I certainly experienced that with you. And as the eight, seven, four, I'm going to be declarative. And my facts or the facts until I learned the Enneagram, I thought my truth was the truth. And why weren't other people telling the truth? But it's very simple. It's subjective. And in the case of the eight, so much of what's been taught 
is that if you get angry, you're an eight. All nine types, all 27 tri-types, all 16 types, all instinctual types get angry. It's what do you do when you're angry? And gut types try to, the one tries to hold it in. They try to stop it when that visceral energy rises and they try to cut it off. So they do this sometimes when they're about to say something ugly and then they catch themselves. Whereas the eight is kind of like, oops, if they're feeling angry. If the eight's not angry, you're not going to hear anything like that. But the eight wants control. So we take great pride in holding our anger because if we display it, we've lost power. All gut types feel that way. We're all dealing with resistance. But in my case as an eight, yeah, you don't want to give up power. The minute you are showing emotional reactivity, you've just lost any space on the chessboard that you might think you have or any interference interferes with negotiation. Now, I've had a lot of training and a lot of systems, so I wasn't as good about that when I was like in high school. But yeah, I've been studying typology since I was 17 years old. So each typology taught me more. But in the case of the nine, it's like, if you show a negative emotion, it will disrupt the peace and harmony, which in the case of the sexual nine, means there'll be a breach in the connection. And since you never know what connection you do or don't want and to what degree the structure is based on holding the one and the eight. So the nine really is the adjusting piece. So is six because it's the center of the head center. But then where you deviate or vary is you've got the two rather than the three as your heart type. So we're very different because within each center, we have a different type. But having said that, the most common denominator for a sexual type and a sexual gut type is another sexual gut type because we're going to endure as gut types and we want to be in sync. Whereas we might have an attraction to people that are other centers, but all my research kind of revealed, even with people that didn't know the Enneagram, originally I took enthusiasts and then I took a hundred people that would never want to know either system or any system, but I was able to persuade them to have their perspective in my research. And they had the same issues. It was very, very easy to see when you spend three hours with an inquiry process and you spend an hour before that on the different systems for typing, which used to all be in person. Now it's online with my test. A lot of what I learned is in the test. But back to the expressions with the nine, there'll be just a smoother, countenance, kind of a dreamier quality. And if nine is the lead, then the indecisiveness or not wanting to have things on a sharp or negative edge is really important. Taking the highs and lows and trying to make them more mid-range, but of the nines, the sexual nine is much spicier. So that means you're going to have those peaks in the valleys and like them, but one at a time, one person at a time, not in a group. Even if you're an extrovert, because you can't get the same closeness with other people, unless there are three people that are in sync, then that can be a lot of fun for a sexual. But the instinct is more important than the types either sets of types. And Mm. then the other thing is that the nine will give some sort of sound that's kind of like a hum. So it might be, hmm, you know, it could be when there's a gesture, though, a sound will go with it. Whereas 
not all types do that, but nines will consistently say, hmm, but it'll have a pleasant, like if you were tasting something that tasted good, hmm, like this is good soup or coffee or ice cream sundae. Whereas the nine will savor it, the eight will inhale it. And we don't realize we're inhaling it, but it's very hard for us to deny ourselves of anything we want. Any pleasures. That is. Let's see, what else? The, the six in the tri-type has you scanning. Two in your tri-type has this gesture. It's interesting because the seven does this and the two does this. It's like the muscles shorten in the back because pride becomes the gesture. But then there's a just a wiggle. And so if someone has the the wiggle and the and the, they're usually the just the seven and two coming together. And the original teachings for the Enneagram, it wasn't called the Enneagram, it was called proto-analysis. And it was just a very analytical understanding of where the tension is in the face, nine points of tension. This is the eight tension right through here. So if someone has a cute little this quality, just when they're relaxing, it's a seven or a three, or maybe a six, but it's not an eight or a one. Even the nine, the nine will in repose have that pleasantness, as I mentioned. But with eight, it'll be, mm, I don't think so. We're quick to say, yeah, if you say so. But we're showing disgust, but we're not meaning disgusting. It can be just as simple as, yeah, I prefer chocolate over vanilla. But we'll still have that gesture because we carry the tension here. And with nine, there's always one eye that really tracks the other person, one that's dead, and the three is the opposite. So if someone has three and nine, either I can go dead, but the lead type will be the least dead. And by dead, I mean diffuse, not empty, but it can be when the nine is distracted and thinking about something, it's like the lights are on, but no one's home. So lost in thought or when I would ask nines, yeah, where do you go? They would say there is no there there. And in one study group that was just nines, they all talked about there's no there there. That in that, what Don and Rusty would call the inner sanctum is just a place of pleasantness that isn't about thought. It's just an internal world where you're, you're neutral is pretty neutral. Whereas the one and eight are kind of good cop and bad cop. The one tries to be the good cop. The eight says, hey, I'm the bad cop. I can't be that good, but the eight's still good, but they're identified with bad. Ones can be bad, but they're identified with good. And the nine's just trying to hold them both. Do you catch yourself that way where you kind of want to say something, but then you think, hmm, yeah, why would you wouldn't do this necessarily? But nines can have a, a straight mouth too. But the eight will have the one actually kind of downturned. But you have to see the other expressions. No one thing is as declarative as we might like it to be. It's what's happening with the body, what's happening with the hands. Is there tension in the hands? Is there fluidity? So it depends on the three types in the tri-type. There's more refinement with four. There's more care and consideration with two and nine. Eight and four, more intensity. Four and seven, more creativity and more focused on what's different, unique, uncommon. And when you have two and six, it's like, the emotions run higher, but they're also repressed. So it's an interesting dynamic. And then you introduce nine and 
all emotions are repressed in favor of creating the connection, especially with sexual, with others. So the eight with six and four, for example, really can't repress. But the eight with seven and four, you can kind of, if you come on too strong, you can kind of smooth it out. And yet we're really pretty honest. Like, I didn't think that I was really a problem, but when I learned about the Enneagram and the types, I thought, well, yeah, I guess I'm more the rugged individualist because I sure knew I wasn't the refined individualist. You could dress me up, but you couldn't take me anywhere. And that's even after years of being in the fashion industry, I was still like a rough stone. So yeah, did I learn a lot? Sure. But can you change a personality type? No. You can polish it, but that's not the same thing as what triggers, what amplifies, what minimizes. So tri-type becomes very important and the stacking of the instincts and the MBTI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I like about you, Catherine, is as an NT type, you like to hold multiple models and correlate them. And so one of them is archetypes. And so you told me that my face is very server and with a little bit of artisan. So you have that main archetype and some people have a subtle flavoring of another one too. So... I wonder if you could go a little bit into that. Yeah. So if you just look at our faces, Joyce has just a very smooth, there aren't any sharp edges coming from what she does with her makeup. Now her corners of her mouth, yes, we can say that. And the eyes, but if you look at mine by comparison, my brows are naturally even sharper. I kind of smooth them out a little bit, but the the jawline has like eight will have a broad jaw you can have someone that has a teardrop face the other way or a heart-shaped face for eight but it's more uncommon more than anything you'll see this quality and when i was still an athlete and i didn't have autoimmune stuff i had the neck was like you know, I was a tennis player. I, my shoulders are still broad, even though, you know, I don't have the competencies and abilities like I did when I was younger. It's like, whereas Joyce, it's all kind of smooth. Now, I'm not saying that nines can't have a broader neck. They can, but they're a different archetype. So I'm the priest archetype but I'm a priest artisan, which is more atypical for an eight. Yet when I was 12, 13, you could see the warrior in me because I wasn't hollow here. <laughs> I was more like, you know, like a little warrior. I was known as the athlete, not the person that, you know, played with dolls. I'd rather blow up like army men with my brothers or make movies where you know, <laughs> we're using ketchup. Now I did have three brothers and the neighborhood was filled with boys too. So I had a lot of training that way. But having said that, that was enjoyable to me. I couldn't imagine what was interesting about taking a little tiny small motor doll clothes on and off. Or I have one picture of me when I was like five years old and I got a, a little baby carriage and a doll and I had to pretend like I liked it and have a picture taken in the rain with <laughs> that was the only time I ever used it because it wasn't me so not that I would say eights don't enjoy being girls they do they like what they are they just don't want to have to deal with unfair pay or we want equality. We don't want to be boys. We're not tomboys. Female eights are not tomboys. That's the most important thing to understand. We like our power wherever we get it, but we're not going to do it in the way the female female will. It'll be seduction with a female eight, but in a 
different way. It'll be because we're interesting or fascinating or like the song with Chrissy Hine, you know, I'll make you notice. And that's more of the eight approach, female eight. She's also an eight, seven, four. So we have to put that into context. But the nine, it's going to be like showing the shoulders or aspects of the body or the movement of the body. The other thing nines do that is different from the eight is you make yourself available when you're interested in someone. So the seduction is availability. And it might even be initiating that would be different from the eight. The eight saying, oh, are you food? Like I always let the boys know when I was in elementary school when I liked them. And I didn't think whether they did or didn't like me, but we'd play basketball or horse or something. And I just happened to be walking by their house. And then like this one boy that I liked when I think I was like 10, he used to wait at his window. I didn't know that. He told me that like at a reunion many years later, but his house wasn't anywhere near mine or a friend of mine. I had to be deliberately walking by. So all female gut types will do that, but the nine has it down to an art. So they just happen to be where that person might be. And you should speak to this more about your availability. As an eight, it's like I was too direct, young. Then I went through puberty and I was told that, you know, I, I was too unrefined and that, this one boy that I liked, he actually had a girlfriend from a different junior high. But what was noteworthy is my friend, the authentic four said, oh, you know, I think he'll probably want to date her. And I said, why? Because to me, she was like, not what I enjoyed. She wasn't athletic. She wasn't, didn't want to go on adventures, but she'd bake cookies and <laughs> do all that stuff. And she said, well, you know, she uh, curls her hair. She wears makeup. She wears perfume and she bakes cookies. Well, what do you think I did after school that day? I went and got makeup and perfume and I already had rollers from my mother, but I used them. Because I was not going to lose if there was someone that I wanted, but I didn't bake cookies. So hand off to you. What did you do to be attractive if there was someone you were interested in? I did make myself more available. I would, I was within their proximity for a connection. And sometimes I would initiate because of the two in my tri-type, but sometimes I would also just wait for them to perhaps notice me because I try to create as many opportunities to interact as possible. And hopefully they'll see me as shiny or desirable or that they want me. Um, but it, it came down to... I felt like visualizing a soulmate, it, it, I hoped that it would give off the energy that someone would want to, they'd notice the energy and want to approach me. So by almost calibrating my energy, I, I hoped that someone would be able to catch it and that we'd have an exchange. And sometimes as a nine, it, it can actually be kind of sad when you have this strong amount of affection for another person. And you feel like they're not noticing you back, that you're a little bit of a wallflower or you're invisible. And so that was something that I also dealt with. Yeah, because of the quiet part of nine, even an extroverted nine, I know you're introverted, but even the extroverted nine can feel like a wallflower because they're quieter. Like I was too loud and you would have been quiet. So people would notice me not because I was yelling anything. I was just like frank, direct, to the point. And I laughed a lot. I mean, I really enjoyed things and still do, actually, anything that I'm fascinated by. But I want to say something else that's important, and that's good old puberty. So when I was talking about my experience with puberty, thereafter, 
I wanted to know that the person of my choosing chose me without me, or so I thought. But then I would know that it's something that was real or what the sexual wants. So you were talking about the wallflower with the aid. I didn't want it to be because I was friendly. I wanted to know they really liked me. And so it was just the opposite. So when you hear about people, like if you if you want someone to talk to everyone else but that person, well, in a way, the eight does that. Naturally, they'll make you notice, but they're, they want that assurance that it's them. They don't want to give away their heart, even if they want that twin flame, not even just soulmate, but twin flame. You want that perfect masculine, feminine, yin-yang mix, but the nine can become that. I can't quite do that, you know no matter how much I might try, but I can be, because I have a natural wing from seven and nine, so I can seem when in love more that way, but I also laugh more and they're more secret conversing that happens that we're just a single word will trigger a whole memory. So now as a nine, by comparison, what do you do to make sure it's about you and not just that you're kind of morphing into the person they want, which nines are really good at. Yeah. And that's a struggle I've had across my life. People will tell me, I know who you've been hanging out with because of how you're acting, because I'll take on the mannerisms of the people I'm around. And even sometimes their values, because I can see why they believe in what they believe, because a nine can see multiple perspectives. And so I can see, yeah, that, that makes sense from your point of view. And so if I'm surrounded by a, a questionable crowd, I could actually develop more flexible ways of seeing things. And, and so I have to kind of be careful who I surround myself with. And I have to make sure that they're positive influences too, because there's that nine desire to, to want to merge. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and so that, that can be a danger point, but I was curious, Catherine, about core energetics. That's also another modality that you juggle around. And I believe that you mentioned how I have an oral fixation or I was curious about if you could describe a little bit more about that. Well, core energetics first emerged with the psychiatrist that started to notice that you could see the struggle of the individual and in the way they help their body. And there are only five character types, but I used to teach this in person. I haven't attempted it other than very roughly online, but in person, you get the swagger the person has and where they carry their weight. Now, gut types, it'll be in the hips down and sexual, it leaks from the eyes. You'll see it in sexual eight that way, but you'll also see it in the kind of the gut base. And a nine, it's the same way, but everything's softer. I mean, even your shoulders are softer. Mine are bonier. Even when I had all the muscle, there was still nothing smooth in the decollete. And so that would be Sheldon's body types in one way were opposite. But in another way, there's kind of a way in which core energetics reveals whether we're schizoid, meaning do we leave our body? Like if something, if we're going to think about it, are we beside ourselves or do we go up and away? And there's a lot of sensitivity and intellectual focus. And then the or oral types are often have longer arms and their eyes are really pretty and compelling. And the mouth is like, so like 
And with the little turn that you have to your mouth like this, I can't do it with mine's mine's too straight. But <laughs> there, there's a little bit. It's still straight, but yeah. So the shape of your mouth is more oral. It's like sucking on a straw or the soft kind of vacuum cleaner eyes with kind of an availability. And then proportionately in the body, often the arms are longer. So it's like, feed me. And oral types need others to feel complete and to just quickly name them all. Then there's psychopathic, which I know all these sound terrible, but they made sense if you looked at them in terms of psychological energy, the way you carry it. And the psychopathy is the energy goes up into the upper shoulders, but when that happens, there's a lot of power here. So a lot of times eights and threes or anyone that let's say is trained in armed forces, they, they've learned to do this. And if they're built that way as well, then when they're powerful is with their eyes set this way. See, I don't have oral eyes. Since I've been sunken from autoimmune, I have much more lid showing than I ever did. My eyes were really more like this before. But they're still different than yours. Yours are soft. From your brow to your eye, there's softness. Whereas the eight eyes are piercing. It's like just that part where I was teasing and saying, are you food? Are you not food? Not food. It is a part of eight, whether we understand it or not. If I say that to another eight, they know exactly what I mean. So it's the fascination quality. A sexual eight is looking for something tasty that's kind of like an individual. So if someone's oral and they're an eight, then everything's food if that makes sense. But attention is food. So is food food. So a lot of times people that are oral will always have something that they're kind of working on in the way of a, like a coffee. Or for me, I have to be thirsty. I don't want to walk and carry it. I could spill it, knock it over. I have to have a lid on everything because it'd be on my computer otherwise. I so wish I could be more of a J in many ways, but I'm just not. I can finish a project when I have to, but it's not my nature. Whereas the psychopathy brings the rush of energy where there's this power, but the head actually shifts for the energy to come off the back to assert an energetic dominance. Now, anyone that feels backed into a corner, any type can become psychopathic and that's to defend. So it's even the scaredest person can do that. And the next is the masochistic and that's usually nine. There's an enduring quality. A lot of the self presates will have a combination of psychopathy and masochism. So everything's kind of thicker arms and ankles and wrists. There's just more of an ability to endure. Now, orality doesn't want to endure, but a common mix for your tri-type in particular in any order is the orality and the masochism. And then of course, if you're pushed, you'll go psychopathic just like anyone else. But then the last one, and there's more to all of these, is rigidity. And rigidity is like balance, shoulder, waist, hip, legs, everything's pretty symmetrical, the features. And so we recognize it most commonly with three and one. And then a new, new author came along and gave a second oral type. He's calling it another type. To me, it's another oral type. And that's symbiotic. And that would be the person who doesn't exist without the other. So more the sexual subtype. And then two types of rigid and really describing the difference between one rigidity 
and the three rigidity. But having said that, any of us can use any of those seven defense structures, but it modifies how we interpret the data. So I know someone that's oral is going to leave a lot more attention than I do because their defense strategy says, I must have attention to exist. And I'm saying I must have autonomy to exist. And it's very complicated to be a sexual eight because eight wants autonomy, no obligation, but sexual wants to give up control. So it will vary according to the relationship. Whereas the nine is more inclined, especially the nine to six, to adjust who they are in service of the relationship. Do you relate to that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I I adjust too by my standards, but that doesn't mean other people would think I adjust that much. You'd have to know me really well to know, oh, wow. Yeah, she's, she's going along with that. And that's not what she usually likes. So it's how are we different in a romantic relationship for sure. But a lot of people don't understand about sexual is it's not just romantic relationships, all relationships are ideally that twinship where you can do the spiraling up and the spiraling down. So your best friend, an intimate connection, you don't have to remember where you were and start over or you just go right back into the relationship. There's no adjustment when you see each other again. It's Mm -hmm. like no time has passed. It could be 10 years. Yeah, yeah, the twinship is everything. That's probably the thing in life that in every single action I do or in life, it's it's that there's that seeking there for sure. All right. And so on that note, talking about the one-to-one instinct, I would like to close off um, today's beautiful interview of the wonderful Catherine. Uh, she talked about earlier how I like to compliment and reassure people, and I'm totally doing it right now as we are watching. So, mm-hmm, yeah. Catherine is a very wise teacher. As you see, she knows so many different modalities and she's constantly learning. She actually likes to learn new information, even if it contradicts what she knows now, because there's something about always learning and the scariest, you know, what's really interesting about you, Catherine, the scariest thing to you is not updating your information. Like it's almost like a lot of people are the opposite where they're very prideful and they don't like to learn new things because they're they don't want to seem like they don't know stuff. Whereas you're very humble about it. You actually, it's scarier for you to ignore new information coming in. And so I'm interesting because I don't use the word scary, but yeah, but what kind of, you're right. yeah, disempowered. Yeah. You feel disempowered when you very eight word. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Or it, it's, yeah, which I like that form of intellectual honesty in you. So this this is a little sneak peek at the things that Catherine teaches in her courses. Feel free to take the study linked below and contribute to some type research that will be looking at the correlations and analyzing the data. Would and, love it. Yeah, we would love it. Yes. We'll see you all in the next episode. Bye. Bye-bye.